Thank you so much to these fabulous women. I'm not going to waste any of our time on introductions. Uh, great news for all of the men who stuck around for this panel that have always wondered what happens at the hottest ticket is GSV ASU, which is the ladies' lunch. You are about to get a little preview of one of the staples of that event. Unfortunately, with no wine ahead of time, we usually do this with uh, a little more liquor in us. But uh, Deb and her team did come up with, I think, a fabulous title, uh, typically excellent, catchy. We don't look like your typical revolutionaries, although Jamie and I were the footwear, uh, to be ready if there's a revolution to be had. Um, but uh, we typically broke the rules. I did my prep calls with some of you individually um, instead of all together. Sorry, Deb. Um, but we all had the same answer to the question uh, that was posed. We do think the revolution is in full swing. Progress has been made. Conditions in the world of work for sure are better than they've ever been. So much better. But with all of the uh, sincere regrets to Barbie and Beyonce, unless you're Taylor Swift, and if you didn't see Bloomberg this morning, please consult it, the first recording artist to make a billion dollars only on her recording deals and uh, singing. Um, so with the exception of Taylor Swift, things are better for women, um, but not yet perfect. Uh, and I want to delve into that nuance and complexity a little bit. We have an academic here on the stage, and Marjorie, um, you did a great job. I don't want to say better than anybody else, uh, but better than anybody else on the stage, uh, of talking about this dichotomy uh, really eloquently about how really as a nation um, we have trouble holding complex and contradictory thoughts. Maybe one gender does more than another, I don't know, uh, in the same conversation. So can you talk about this, you know, it's better, but it's not perfect, and why you think we have trouble expressing those thoughts in the same discussion? Um, it's, a, it's a great question, and I, I agree. We, we have to be able to hold complicated yes, but, yes, and thoughts in our head. One of the reasons I think this is particularly challenging for us when we think about the uh, changes in what we've seen uh, in terms of what women can expect from our lives and livelihoods is because we tend to think of the uh, the opportunities that have opened for women as though they just sort of happened magically or um, naturally. Um, you know, this was the work of really significant protesting, of uh, activity, of complicated action uh, that women undertook together. And we tend not to lift up the heroes of the women's movement. In fact, if anything, we tend to denigrate them in the way we do not do around um, most other social movements that have made um, such significant change. So one thing we need to do is we need to return to that history and lift up our foremothers. But the yes but, what follows the but? A number of things. For all of the advances that we've made and all of the opportunities that our daughters have and your daughters have, we also are seeing places where there's been little change or we're actually seeing change go backwards. Um, women still face an inordinate amount of uh, harassment in tech, whether that's in online gaming or in their uh, engineering physics course in college or um, when they begin to enter the world of work. We still see wide disparities in the attainment of white women compared to black and brown women. We cannot say that women have achieved if all we mean is that white women have opportunities um, that, that um, other women do not or that sometimes come at the expense of other women. Um, we still see large disparities in opportunities, even such things as being able to learn to read but, uh, in between uh, different geographic regions and within different religious traditions and cultural traditions. That is not okay. And finally, we're seeing 
significant backtracking in uh, our commitment to women's health. The end of row, certainly, you know, we can have differences of opinion on late-term elective abortion or even perhaps mid-term or early-term elective abortion, but those new laws are affecting women's health in uh, horrendous ways, and they are also about to, uh, in many states, threaten women's freedom of movement um, you're going to have government tracking of your period. You're going to have uh, having to sign various statements before you leave a state, having tracking. I mean, really horrible things that have the potential to set women back. I think we absolutely have to begin tracking um, the relationship between women's education attainment and some of these new laws because I think just as we saw a boom in women's uh, opportunities when uh, we began to have more control of our reproductive freedom, I predict we will see a backtracking as we lose those rights. So all of those things are very much on my mind. Uh, very last comment, Barbie is on her way. Ken, we need you to catch up. So um, we do need good men, I'm sure all the men in this room are good men, to uh, take the advancement of women as seriously as you take anything else. So we're counting on you. That's awesome. Um, I hate boring panels. Um, those of you who know me, they're not going to be surprised on that. So I generally don't ask the same question to two people, but I spoke to Jamie and Kate separately, and you both said the same thing that really struck me, and it was um, also got to this better, uh, not perfect, but also about the amount of progress. Um, I'm old, for those of you who hadn't noticed yet. Um, and you talked about how the revolution feels different when you're working with your own predominantly female leadership teams. Mm -hmm. And the reason that struck me so hard is, for those of you who don't know, uh, I was the governor of Massachusetts two decades ago. And when I became governor, I was, counseled would be a mild word, not to hire the young female staff member who had been by my side and ostensibly got me to that point, but instead that I needed to surround myself with men, older men, uh, who could give me all the ideas and support and good uh, counsel that I would need in order to be successful. So even the fact that it is uh, terrific female CEOs, you're able to assemble um, almost entirely or at least predominantly female leadership teams, I think is huge progress that we need to call out. Um, but what I want you both uh, to talk about is um, the practical ways you see your teams being more productive and your leadership being enhanced because you're allowed to compose your team in that way, in a way that's right for you and to pick the colleagues who help to make you better in a way that I am not bitter, but was not able uh, to do. So Kate, why don't you go first? Yeah, absolutely. So. So it's just, I'm about three months into having a majority female C-suite at Presence. And the big change that, that I had was I, I brought in a new CFO over the summer and first reflected a lot on you know the last time that I had been choosing a CFO. I very much had in my head and was getting the advice from uh, board members, investors of, you know, to think about pairing with a CFO who would help validate me. And I did, my previous CFO, who was wonderful as well, was a, you know, a, a gray-haired man who, you know, could help me out with, I guess, my, my, you know, gender disadvantage as well as I've been told that I look younger than I am. I don't know. I heard that before too. I don't hear that anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I might be crossing over soon. We'll see. Um, but so, you know, and, and so when choosing that CFO and then working with him over those years, that, that had been a major factor in how I chose that, that member of the team. Whereas uh, at this point, bringing in a new CFO, the, it was really refreshing with my board, with my investors to just align on, you know, I was going to choose the right 
CFO for what we needed as a team. Uh, a lot of that had to do with collaboration style and communication style. And as I was talking to candidates and thinking about the fit with my team, I ended up finding that, that my three finalists were all women. And I think it, it has to do with communication styles, different trust within a team can be different uh, in how genders approach it. And so, uh, you know, bringing in a ultimate female CFO and watching how much it changed our budgeting process, our planning process, the way that we have conversations about spending, it's uh, the, the rest of the team is much more involved and uh, just much happier, even when we're, you know, if, if we're asking for cost savings, that's never the most popular thing, but I'm finding that the team can go and work together with CFO and bring me back something constructive, whereas I used to have to intervene a lot more. That's awesome. Jamie? Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about, so when we, when I set out to build our leadership team, it was very important to me, representation matters. Um, and we're right now about a little more than half female representation on the executive team. But beyond that, all of us are running very important education companies and organizations that have pretty big impact on kids uh, and educational outcomes. And so what I've always tried to strive for is making sure that the executive team, the leadership team as a whole is reflective of both those we serve at our organization and then those who we serve um, out in the broader community. What I find, the other part of this is, if you look at the research, we know that organizations, companies, mine being private equity backed, uh, have higher long-term financial performance when you have uh, strong representation, diversity and representation uh, on your executive team. So that matters in terms of building growth, sustainable growth, uh, and then impact. I think one of the things that we've tried really hard as a team and I've tried really hard as an individual leader is this idea of vulnerability um, and the way that women lead from a vulnerability perspective. So all of the hard things you think of as a human, as a leader, as somebody working in an organization that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we make it okay that when you look to your executive team, you see those same challenges, the, the different things that we all work through as parents, as humans, for that to be okay and to be very real. And so our leadership team, all different backgrounds, um, over half of which are women, we try really, really hard to put that vulnerability on display on a very regular basis. So when things are hard, we make sure people know that it feels hard. When we're working through a particularly large challenge at Admentum, we don't hide it, go into a room and try to figure it out. We try to involve as many people as possible. And I think also part of vulnerability is this idea of we versus I. And so waking up every day knowing that collectively, like to build this great organization and do all the great things we want to do, like there has to be a we part of it. And it's the leadership team, but it's also the collective organization. And really, as a female leader, making sure that we're very mindful of how we show up, the exposure that we have around just being regular human beings as leaders, and then especially for younger women, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the questions, but especially for younger women, seeing that there is a track you can take to get to these jobs, and it doesn't have to be one certain way. It can be filled with all of the challenging things that go with being a mom, a woman, trying to, to create an organization, so. So that's a great segue, because um, Ashley, I loved on our talk, and you and I and Jamie talked together, um, that you had a powerful call out to all of us, that, and it was a great reminder that it's not just whether or not we get to equal power, but when we get there, how do we use that power, right? And how do we use it differently, which is something I've been talking to a lot of women's groups when I give speeches about, right? It won't matter if we don't use our power differently and obviously you have that power uh, and as Jamie said such uh, powerful women running really important companies in our education sector and um, I definitely see it right uh, Deb included Beyonce I loved I don't think she's here anymore the woman who uh, brought up the M word menopause yesterday right on the stage uh, on the other side of that, but I still remember. Uh, so I already told you I was old, so now you're getting the ladies' lunch part, guys. Uh, but, and the wine, uh, no wine for me this morning, but I can still 
be there. Uh, anyway, but Beyonce calling for sexual empowerment, Taylor Swift. Now, not everybody agrees with me with this. I think she's using the NFL's platform to drive movie and uh, record sales. They don't call them records anymore. Um, but using power differently, right? I totally hope she is using Travis Kelsey just to drive sales, and it's not even a real romance. That's my personal opinion. I'm just saying men have done it forever, and I'm totally hoping she's using him. Anyway, and I hope it's fun, too. Anyhow, um, how... Uh, Ashley, do you use your power differently? It has, does not have to be anything about sex. I meant really about just in the whole Woo, thing. Woo, that's about, a relief. Right. How do you use your power differently at work? Good qualification there, Jane. Um, first of all, I think this is a really important question because um, it is important that we celebrate and recognize leaders who navigate barriers who navigate an environment and we want leaders who navigate barriers and create success for themselves by doing so to help others learn how to do that. We want that to happen, but we're not in the business of creating opportunity for all if we just take a system of barriers and change out who's sitting in the seats, right? That actually doesn't change anything other than who's sitting in the seats. And so, you know, when we think about this challenge or this question, you know, Maslow gave us the hierarchy of needs. There is a hierarchy of leadership, right? There's the leadership that starts with doing the doing, doing the hard work, actually, you know, learning and honing and putting in the work. There's the hard work of navigating those barriers and creating success for yourself, navigating those barriers. There's the hierarchy of teaching others to navigate those barriers, helping them understand how to navigate those barriers. And then there's the part of the hierarchy which is actively removing the barriers, creating meaningful change to sustain opportunity for all. And so I'm, it's taken me a chunk, a big chunk of my leadership journey to understand that. Um, I'll give you an example from my personal life because this translates into my thinking about how I am intentional about using power differently. So um, I am fortunate enough to be blessed with my better two thirds, my husband Peter, who is hands down the best person I know. Um, we are an education family. He's a middle school math teacher and high school football coach. And other than during football season, he is the primary caregiver for our daughter, Alex, and has been since she was 60 days old. And his commitment and dedication to our family in that way has made it possible for me to do what I do, right? I, this came up on a few panels yesterday. Doing a hard job successfully requires hard work. There is no way around that. There is no shortcut to that. That is a truth. Doing a hard job successfully requires hard work. Now, there are different ways you can do it, but it requires hard work. So when I think about and I'm asked regularly about the advice that I have for others about navigating an environment and navigating a system. Okay, so one piece of advice I could give is about the concept of productive struggle and doing hard work and all of those kinds of things. But is that scalable? Is the right advice to everyone who's seeking to lead an organization to go get a spouse who wants to be a primary caregiver? Is that a scalable and repeatable with fidelity piece of advice to give out? Um, I think I might have started earlier in my career with giving that kind of advice. I don't give that kind of advice anymore. What I do is I work with a really talented team who systemically and intentionally looks for challenges in our policies, our benefits, our structure that create barriers to opportunities for full participation, for the opportunity to engage in meaningful work. And, you know, so when I think about, um, when I was running a joint venture startup where we could barely even spell leave policy, let alone have one, when my daughter was born, you know, I was taking conference call. I literally took a conference call the day that we brought her home from the hospital. Um, okay, productive struggle, I'm a hard worker. Is that necessary for everybody to be a great CEO? No, that is not a necessary struggle for everybody to be a great CEO. So, you know, I'm blessed to work with an incredibly talented chief people officer, Melissa Yates May. She and her team relentlessly scrutinize our benefits and our leave policy. And we have an extremely robust and inclusive leave policy for women and men. 
because women can fully engage in and participate in the workforce when not only they have appropriate leave, but so do their partners. That's just a simple example. Yes, it takes a commitment and it takes an investment and it is a change. It's a big change, but it's an important and structural change that's an example of moving a removing a barrier to full participation and full opportunity for women and men. That's awesome. Deb, I think people are gonna be sorry they don't come to the women's lunch. <clears throat> oh, they find out I was talking about sex on the stage. Anyway, uh, Jamie, back to you. Uh, <laughs> So we've all acknowledged, right, that there are areas uh, of the revolution that still need work. Um, and I think all of you have heard, and anybody who's talked to me for more than five minutes knows that I got two very challenging calls this summer from my daughters uh, who called and said to me, oh my God, mom, I thought you said it was gonna be better. Uh, and here's X that happened to me today or what I found out that isn't better. Um, so what area, and your daughter's about 10 years behind mine, uh, so what area do you think needs the most progress so that you and Kay and Ashley uh, are not getting that call or you have a better answer when your daughter calls you in 15 years? Well, I think the reality is we will still get that call. Uh, it'll just be to what degree, you know, have we moved things forward and have we progressed? So. If you just step back and look at how much progress we have or haven't made from a female representation, we're still, depending on the year, five to 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. We still, in a decade, haven't improved the fact that in public education, well over 50% of school leaders, building leaders, principals are women, yet never more than 25% of the superintendents in public education are women. Um, and so, and then you look at just all companies in the US, uh, and we're generally around 25 to 30% of those companies are run by women. So, in a decade, right? We jump around in the percentage. Um, so the thing that I think about is, and I went, I'll go back to what I said before on representation, like we have an obligation, Ashley, you, you touched on this, and when I think about the most important thing, at least from my perspective, um, when I'm, talking to other female leaders who have aspirations to do X, maybe it's CEO, maybe it's to run a large school system, um, pick your, your executive leadership. The most important thing I think we can do outside of just all of us taking our responsibility very seriously in terms of how we move women through the pipeline uh, is this idea of taking risk. So when there is an executive position open, generally speaking, the research shows that if a man can check off one or two of the job requirements, he will go for it. And women by nature tend to look at that job description and say, I have to check all of these or I'm not going to be good enough to go after it. And so just by the nature of like, if you have the aptitude and you've done some of the things that this particular job or role within an organization is asking you to do, just go for it. Because at minimum, you're going to learn. So there's this idea of risk taking um, and how do we help women think through ways in which you can take more risk earlier on in your career I've had the same experiences where, you know, I went to back, back to work with my first child a um, couple weeks after I had him, uh, and I took a whole two months uh, after my daughter was born, but when I first became CEO of my last company, my daughter, Maeve, she was six months old. Uh, and I remember the importance of, at that time, why I took that risk. Second, though, to the risk-taking is creating this environment and this community of women who can lift you up other women leaders, every one of you on this stage, we just get to know each other, but all the other women um, are incredibly important, whether directly having conversation or watching what you do and leading your organizations, it is so empowering to me personally, and so really making sure you help other female leaders understand how to build those informal communities around you. The second week on the job in my last company, my daughter got RSV, and she was hospitalized, and I remember that moment almost 11 years ago where I'm sitting in the hospital in the second week on the job, still trying to prove myself as a first time CEO who also happens to be female, and my kid's on oxygen, right? And so who do you call in your network when you're like trying to figure out, you know, doing all this restructuring, trying to figure out the strategic plan and all that, and my kid is on oxygen in the hospital. And from that point, I was very intentional about surrounding myself with other women leaders, where I can call up Jane Swift and ask her what's going on with these night sweats I'm now having for the women in the room, you know what I'm talking about. 
um, on and on and on and on. And that matters. Uh, and I think you know the risk-taking aspect and building a community of people, of women, who sh have those shared experiences, it is so empowering from a leadership perspective and it keeps you going. So those are the areas that I, I really think we need to focus on. Here, here. Um, Marjorie, I'm gonna go back to you because I think part of the reasons that my daughters, right, were so surprised at what they found besides the fact that the two of them also work in professional sports, which is not exactly a bastion of female power, um, but well, they thought it, they it, could. It will be when Taylor's done with it. Yes, so. yes, Taylor is <laughs> taking that over. Um, is because our college campuses have been so transformed by Title IX and with many more young women than young men on those college campuses and with those women often getting some of the most significant accomplishments and achievements, it creates this belief, right? Maybe sometimes a false belief of what the world looks like that they're going to enter into. And also, frankly, sometimes resistance from men um, and other leaders of like, why do we continue to need to do this advocacy? Look what's happening. Um, you've invited us to hold complexity and nuance uh, in these conversations. So how should college leaders, particularly women presidents, um, be preparing young women like my daughters for the reality of what they'll face? Well, at the same time, um, and I struggle with this myself, still inspiring them to like, as Jamie said, to go for it, to be risk takers, to be bold. I, I spent much of my career as a college president, and I would often, when I would speak to uh, parent groups or to even students themselves or to boards, and they would say, you know, we see there's some differences in terms of, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more women going to college, fewer men going to college, we're seeing a shift there. And I would say, well, when you look at attainment, girls do, their grade point averages on average are better in high school. They uh, now increasingly are doing, at, uh, on average, doing better on some of the high stakes testing, and the high stakes testing is becoming less important uh, as a measure of readiness for college, because it's not really a very good measure. Um, and women do better in college. They have higher GPAs, they win more of the academic awards, they tend to uh, do more of the value added uh, experiential things, even things like having an internship or studying abroad, women take more advantage of. But I would remind them, don't worry, because when they leave our campus and go out into the world of work, the men will still earn more money for the same job. And that is also true, right? So we're seeing that advance at, at the college level. And in many ways, it, it becomes a shock for young women. This is one of the reasons that I think, you know, there's this sort of lack of lifting up the women who have made this revolution possible for so many of us, because we tend to look around at college and we think, oh, well, this is easy and fair. Well, you know, in college, we're customers. I would not use that language in front of any of my faculties, of <laughs> course, but, um, you know, women are, are customers. They're treated pretty well, especially since Title IX, et cetera. But as they look beyond that to the leadership level, they see, they do see those gaps. In all of my jobs, I've been the first woman, first Jewish person to hold these roles, and it's been shocking to me how impactful that is, even for these really empowered young women, to have a woman president. They're aware of um, who serves not just on the faculty, but in those leadership roles. There's still a huge gap between the, you know, at the, at the uh, full professor level. There's a huge gap in who serves on our boards. They know where the power lies. So simply seeing women achieve has not always translated into women's empowerment. And again, this is true even more, uh, especially when you look at black women in particular um, and brown women uh, as well. Black women uh, achievements does not match their power that they have in organizations. So we have to help women understand that it's about taking the power. It's not simply checking the boxes uh, or getting the degree or getting the credential. And that um, is gonna be very, very important. We also have to look at more change faster at the top. I don't think we'll see radical shifts in the hiring of women into these positions until we uh, see 
changes in our boards. And finally, last thing on this is that when you look particularly at the college and university level, um, there is absolutely a truth that you see immediately around the glass cliff. Um, women are increasingly being hired into uh, situations that are often impossible or they're given a timeline that is nearly impossible. Part of what you see is the churn, particularly of women, and again, particularly women in color, of color in these leadership roles is because they're hired into a position and the board says to them, well, we gave the white guy that preceded you 15 years to run the place into the ground. You have 18 months to fix it. And we don't want any resistance, right? And so um, we absolutely need to, um, to, to notice that and to call that out. All right, I'm gonna talk really fast because I wanna to get to these last two hard questions. So Ashley, um, these are hard questions. One of the things you brought up is as we mentor these young women, mine and Marjorie's who are entering the workforce, we also need them to be successful, right? Because they need to power the revolution. Some of us are getting old post-menopause. Um, and so how do we tell them how uh, to push for the changes that we need to, for tomorrow, but also which fights are worth taking on? Something I'm not always good at. Mm -hmm. This is ultra important. So um, what I'd like to start with is a question for all of you. Raise your hand if you would describe yourself as a quitter. I'm putting my hand down. Uh, raise your hand if you would like to teach your children to be quitters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mostly nobody, um, <laughs> mostly nobody, which is not surprising given the room that we're in, I would expect nothing less, but it's worth asking because, and it's worth scrutinizing, it's worth even scrutinizing what we view as our definition of quitting, um, of being a quitter. And the reason that I say that is because, let's say we, let's say we do all the right things. Um, you know, we teach one another and our children, and we support one another and our children to work hard and to do the work. We teach one another and our children to not only earn what they deserve, but then to ask for what they deserve and ask for what they've earned. And we teach them the right ways to do that, and we teach them the right ways to seek sponsorship to support them in that process and develop community and develop advocacy for themselves in that process. Let's say we've taught everybody to do all of those things, right? Um, let's say that we've relentlessly scrutinized our own organizations and our sphere of influence and our sphere of impact, and we've scrutinized all of the boring, mundane things like our policies and our all of those things, and we've done all that hard, relentless work. And one of our children calls us and says, Mom, I thought you said this was better, right? Um, like the experience you have. And I think there's a reality that we have to accept, each of us, that there is productive struggle and there is unproductive struggle. This is a question of time and this is a question of love. Those two things are our most valuable and precious resources and how we spend them matters. How we spend them matters. So. We can do all the right things in a situation or an organization and as an advocate, as an ally, as the person who is seeking the opportunity, we can do all the right things in a situation and we can not only not be successful in our ask, we can sometimes be penalized for asking at all, for having the audacity to ask, for having the audacity to seek what we've earned. And when that happens, when that happens, there is a critical and real calculus that has to be done. And the calculus is, do I gain anything I need, do I gain anything that I need in pursuit of my meaningful journey by being here, by contri continuing to contribute to this situation, or is it time for me to say this is not a productive struggle? Right? And that is not the same thing as quitting. That is, the, that is being intentional about where you should invest your time and love. Your time and love are your most valuable resources, your most precious resources, and you should be intentional about investing them because you are powerful and amazing people or you wouldn't be here. And so the last thing I'll just say, I'll end with a call to action for each of us because we each have something to do with how 
supportive our organizations are and whether they are the types of organizations that people should invest their time and love in. And there are small things that each of us can do every day to ensure that we are creating the right kind of organization. I will credit our Chief Operating Officer, Kemi Akinsanya Rose, who is extremely intentional. She sends me an email every week with a list of people on her team who she wants me to send a shout out to because of something they did that week. And she started that tradition in our organization at the executive level. And the executives send me emails. They are my favorite emails to write each week. I get to write people and say, amazing job at this. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for your hard work in this. And that happens all the way throughout the organization. It, it makes a meaningful difference. It's a small thing, but it really matters. So hopefully you've all seen, right? Like amazing women leaders doing amazing things. There's also a need to have to manage up. And we haven't changed boardrooms. We haven't changed a lot of the conditions that when you get to this level, you have to then um, do. So uh, with all due respect, uh, Kate, I asked you if I could put you on the spot, but um, what would you want the folks who are now on those, in those boardrooms, on those investment committees, uh, the kind of folks who were telling me, right, that I needed a male uh, chief of staff, uh, how do we better manage up? And we have no time, so uh, we could just throw bracelets. Should we do that? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I will give the, the short version of this, which is, and, and Jane's asking me because um, the board that I report to is all men. Um, and, and I was sharing with her an anecdote of when, it, when I was working, when I was leading our majority recap transaction, um, I went into a Zoom that had four investor groups and all of their lawyers and all of their, and, and my, my CEO and my lawyer and my general counsel. And, it was, and I looked at this Zoom with, you know, like two, two screens worth of boxes and I was like, oh my God, I'm the only woman on this Zoom right now. But I was also in charge and they had to listen to me. And so, you know, I had to learn to change my communication style to when managing up and to remember that, you know, I had the right to be directive and to expect to be listened to, to, I, you know, I still sometimes do have to call out uh, the room when they're interrupting and not letting me finish a thought. Um, but I think that's, that's what I can do in the position that I'm in now. I think the big ask always to those who are on the other side of that, who are on those boards is, you know, please listen make sure that you are actively listening to uh, all of your leaders, um, but especially your women leaders. So um, we are, I think, the last thing before lunch, and I know many other moderators have made it a point to thank uh, both Michael and Deb for pulling this together. I would be remiss, uh, and not just because her mother just came in, but um, everybody here has talked about um, the power of women luncheon, and I'm sorry for the guys who will never be invited uh, and will never have to listen to me talk about sex again, uh, but um, maybe. Um, but in all seriousness, I think for all of us, that forum, but also uh, what Deb has pulled together and um, frankly, personally, um, and I wish Dr. Hines was still here because I thanked her um, because there will come a time in all of our lives and as most of these women and certainly Deb knows, um, I had one of those times, right, where for two years um, I was at the worst point in my life and to have the most powerful woman in education technology work to keep you relevant when you just couldn't work um, for two years when you're our postmenopausal, right? And it's um, a gift that she has given all of us and to put this panel on um, and to honor it and the power that women in this industry has is something doesn't happen in every industry. And we are tremendously grateful and we have and maybe an extra bracelet for you because no. we brought I brought bracelets. friendship bracelets in the honor of Taylor Swift. <laughs> Let's stand up and give Deb Deborah. a round of applause. Deb, this one's for you. This is for you. This is for you, Deb. This says badass. <laughs>